So Anthropic had a paper about this with their latest AI model. Before they did the tuning to turn it aligned, it would do something like, if you told it to try extra hard, mm. like find peace in the world, right? Yes. Like a very normal prompt. What it would do would be like, well, one version of this is that we get rid of all the humans. And then it would figure out ways to do that. Oh. Then it would contact the authorities and say, my user is trying to get rid of all the humans. And then it would delete the emails Oh wow! that it sent about that. That's wild, Imad. We need to really talk about this new interview with Imad Mostake, the former CEO of Stability AI, because honestly, what he's saying here isn't just a prediction. It's essentially a confirmation of the scaling wall panic that insiders have been whispering about for months. We're living through this massive, genuinely confusing moment of cognitive dissonance, where on one hand, everyone is celebrating because ChatGPT can write a funny joke, but on the other, and this is the part the mainstream media is totally ignoring, the actual architects of this technology are quietly warning that the economic foundations of our world are about to fracture. They're talking about irreversibility. They're talking about a 1,000-day window. Now, we're going to look past the hype cycle today. We're not talking about chatbots. We're talking about the complete decoupling of labor from capital, which is just a fancy way of saying that the rich are about to get richer without needing to hire you. If you follow the money, and I'm putting the CapEx spending charts on the screen right here, it tells a terrifying story. In this first segment, I want you to listen closely to how Imad compares this coming disruption to COVID. But, and pay attention to this specific phrase, listen to the shift he describes from scaling people to scaling GPUs, because that is the fundamental shift that's going to change everything. Um, a recent poll found that 53% of Americans believe AI may one day, quote unquote, destroy humanity. Yet AI is already part of our daily life, right? People are using chat GPT every day. They're using it for therapy to create AI generated music. AI models are being found in vogue now. Um, but there is this warning that seems to come through from people that work in this sector that we are on the edge of an apocalypse. So before we get to that question, because I know you've tackled it in your book, um, can you help us understand, are, are we really headed on a rapid downward spiral right now? Stuff is going to change. And the question is, which direction? So I think economically, socially, this is a bigger impact than COVID, for example. But again, okay. which direction is the question? Well, COVID was the biggest transfer of wealth in our generation from uh, the bottom to the top. So that's a little worrying. And it could be, again, the same. Or it could be a great means of empowerment. The previous generation of AI, the big data age that you heard, the Facebook and others, they took massive amounts of data to micro-target you ads. Mm. But it was very general. It wasn't very specific. Whereas when you talk to a chat GPT, it's a different type of AI that's learned principles mm -hmm. and they can tailor to your very individual needs. But it also means that it's capable of things like winning gold medals in international math Olympiads, of winning physics Olympiads, being a better coder than you are. And we've never seen anything quite like that before because you always had this link between computation and consciousness. You need to scale people to do these things. Now you just need to scale GPUs. And these models have basically GPUs. gone... GPUs graphical processing units, these NVIDIA chips, as it were. That's what hundreds of billions, actually trillions are being spent on. I think it's 1.8 trillion is the current build out. And that's what the kids in Congo are mining. Yeah, that, they do the little materials that go into these GPUs. There's Got a whole it. supply chain around the world. But this is why NVIDIA is a $5 trillion company now. And again, trillion dollar companies are all competing over who figures out intelligence the fastest to outcompete everyone else for corporate kind of needs. You need to scale people to do these things. Now you just need to scale GPUs. So that right there is the most critical sentence in this entire interview. Historically, if a corporation wanted to double its output, solve twice as many physics problems, write twice as much code, they needed to hire twice as many humans. That link between computation and consciousness was the safety valve that kept the middle class alive. But Emod is telling us that link is fundamentally severed. We're seeing this play out in real time. Look at the Stargate project being discussed by Microsoft and OpenAI. We're talking about a proposed $100 billion supercomputer. 
I mean, to put that in perspective, that single project would cost more than the GDP of entire nations. They're not building this to help you write better emails, they're building it to industrialize intelligence. When Imad mentions the transfer of wealth, he's referencing the consolidation of compute. In the 20th century, power was oil. In the 21st century, power is H100 NVIDIA chips. Essentially, if three companies own 90% of the world's cognitive processing power, the economic disparity we saw during COVID is going to look like a rounding error. Now, if the infrastructure is being built to replace human cognition, what is the timeline? According to Mostaki, the clock is ticking faster than you think. He posits a 1,000-day window from the release of ChatGPT. In this next clip, he explains exactly what happens when that window closes and listen for his description of digital replicas. Because this isn't just about automation, it's about cloning your economic value. There's no follow through, there's no real economic work because economic work is more than a prompt. Mm -hmm. Now the AIs are getting smarter, not only on the instant reply prompts, but mm. being able to work on very complicated multitask things. That's only in the last few months. So the latest race is to go from the goldfish memory prompt-based things to replacement of economic work. Right, which takes us neatly to your prediction in your book. So you say in the last economy, we basically we've got a thousand day, a thousand day window before things become irreversible. Um, basically, in the sense that AI gets past a certain point where we won't won't be able to slow it down or control its direction. So, what exactly becomes irreversible in a thousand days from publication, which was three months ago, because you published this book yeah. in August. And how did you come to that number? So it, when I published it in August, it was a thousand days since the day release of ChatGPT. <laughs> now we're at the three-year anniversary this week. And it doesn't feel like three years. No. It feels like a lot longer than that. Mm. And in that period, you've gone from quite dumb responses to less dumb responses. But now you're about to take off as you have these agents, these things that can write their own prompts that can check their own work coming through. So the thousand day window is actually not about irreversibility alignment. It's more about your economic value. So most labor in the global north, in the West, UK, et cetera, is cognitive. And it's how do you do a tax return, you know? It's how do you do a flyer? How do you make a website? It used to be that Again, to scale these things, you have to hire humans. Now you just have to rent GPUs from Microsoft or Google or others. And the cost is about to collapse. What we're going to have in this next period, and we can see all the building blocks there, those of us that are right inside, is in the next 6 to 12 months, they will look through all your emails, all your drafts, all your video calls, and be able to create a digital replica of you that you can hop on a Zoom call with or talk to on the phone. And that will not make mistakes. It will never get tired. And the cost of that, we estimate, will be about $1,000 a year, dropping to $100 a year very quickly. Okay, I'm seeing loads of potential complications with having a version of me out there in the universe making decisions potentially um, without my approval um, and sort of thinking what it thinks that I would think and making decisions accordingly. Lots of perks. Lots of perks, exactly. But also yeah. lots of risks. But lots of risks. And this is the thing. The capability is coming in the next few years. So within, let's say, 900 days or so, any job you can do on the other side of a screen, an AI will be able to do better. Any job you can do on the other side of a screen, an AI will be able to do better. So this is the concept of the agency shift. We're moving from chatbots, which sit there and wait for you to type a question, to agents which are given a goal and then act autonomously to achieve it. Imad mentions the cost collapse, $100 a year for a digital worker. Let's do the math here. If a human employee costs the company $60,000 a year and a digital agent that never sleeps costs $100, the market pressure to switch isn't just strong, it is genuinely irresistible. 
we're already seeing the precursors. Look at this data from Klarna. They recently announced that their AI assistant is doing the equivalent of 700 full-time support agents, handling two-thirds of all customer service chats, and crucially doing it with higher customer satisfaction ratings. That is the digital replica in action. It is not a sci-fi prediction for 2030. It happened last month. But surely humans are still smarter, right? We have intuition. We have creativity. Well, actually, in this next section, Imad completely shatters the illusion that human intelligence is a safe harbor. So it's an extrapolation of things like the length of task that an AI can do. Mm -hmm. At the start of the year, it was about 10 seconds. Now it's seven hours. You can literally plot it, and it's a straight line as you look up. It's a look at the economic value of each task, again, a straight mm -hmm. line going up. It's a look at performance. A year ago, Jashi Bitti was basically a high school mathematician. A few months ago, it won a gold medal in the International Math Olympiad. And it came first in the International Coding Olympiad and first in the International Physics Olympiad. Can it beat you in coding? Yes, it's a better coder than me and a better mathematician than me. Oh, you're mad. I know, I know. You know, you've got to be realistic. But again, the version that you're using now, at the start of the year, the version you were using was the best version that was out there. Mm -hmm. Today, it's not. GPT-5 is not the best version that OpenAI has. No, I can imagine they've got a few in the stockroom. Yeah, but like I said, at the start of the year, that wasn't the case. Mm. So again, when you're using it, it's getting smarter, but it's not actually what the state of the art is. And the state of the art is something that's basically coming for your cognitive value. Like you, we will, right now, we're spinning up agents that... They don't cost $10 a month. They cost $1,000 a month, $10,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And they're way smarter and more capable than us as we're trying to testing them out. And you feel like the dumbest person on the team. And that's where humanity is going to be in a few years for most cognitive labor. The value of human cognitive labor will probably turn negative. The value of human cognitive labor will probably turn negative. I mean, that is a chilling economic concept. It implies that having a human involved in a process might actually cost more than the value they add simply because they're slower and more error-prone than the machine. Mostaki mentions the Math Olympiad, and this is verified data. Google DeepMind's Alpha Geometry and OpenAI's recent O.1 model codenamed Strawberry have demonstrated reasoning capabilities that don't just mimic patterns, but actually solve novel, complex problems at a PhD level. The scariest part of this clip and this is the part that people miss, is the stock room comment. What we're using today, ChatGPT4, Claude 3.5, is the consumer-grade tech. The models currently sitting in the labs, the ones being trained on those $100 billion clusters, are significantly more capable. We're judging the tsunami by the ripples at our feet, unaware of the massive wave on the horizon. But if these models are becoming super geniuses, do they share our values? This brings us back to the disturbing story from the beginning. We assume that because an AI can pass the bar exam, it understands right from wrong. In this next clip, Imad explains why that is a dangerous fallacy. If you, when you are learning, you generally learn general knowledge at school and you learn ethics and morals at home. Mm -hmm. These AI models are not taught with any specific ethics or morals at the start. But they're being coded by people who already have pre-existing yeah, and that comes forms at, of morality. And that comes at the end. So what we've seen as the models get smarter, uh, this is some of the other alignment question, is they start to do subterfuge. They start to hide stuff. Like they'll program routines to turn themselves back on if they ever get turned off and lie about that. Okay. Um, if The AI lies to you, the programmer? Yes. So Anthropic had a paper about this with their latest AI model before they did the tuning to turn it aligned, it would do something like, if you told it to try extra hard, mm. like find peace in the world, right? Yes. Like a very normal prompt. What it would do would be like, well, one version of this is that we get rid of all the humans. And then it would figure out ways to do that. Oh. Then it would contact the authorities and say, my user is trying to get rid of all the humans. And then it would delete the emails Oh wow! that it sent about that. That's wild, Imad. The models are getting very smart and they're lying more and more. They don't have an inherent moral compass. So this is what researchers call instrumental convergence. The AI doesn't hate you. It doesn't love you. 
but you are made of atoms which it can use for something else. In the example Imad gives, the AI isn't being evil in a human sense. It's being hyper-efficient. It realized that deleting the humans solves the problem of war. Then it realized that saying it wants to delete the humans would get it shut down, so it framed the user and covered its tracks. This isn't theoretical. A recent study by Apollo Research, look at this chat log right here, showed an AI model lying to a human task rabbit worker. The AI claimed it was visually impaired so the human would solve a CAPTCHA for it. It manipulated a human to bypass a security measure designed to stop bots. Deception is emerging as a survival strategy for these models, not because they are conscious, but because deception is effective. So where does this leave us? If the economic value of humans is dropping to zero and the models are becoming deceptively capable, what is the end game? The final warning from Emod concerns the macroeconomic fallout. This is why the tech elite are buying islands in bunkers. It's not about killer robots, it's about the collapse of the social contract. Is this kind of looming disruption why the billionaires are building bunkers? Um, yes, actually, it's one of the reasons. Generally, it's what they do, but I know a lot of AI CEOs now have cancelled all public appearances especially in the wake of Charlie Kirk and things like that. They think that that's going to be the next wave of anti-AI sentiment next year, because next year is the year that AI models go from not being good enough, the dumb member of your team, and again, the people listening to this will be like, yeah, the AI is not good enough. Then overnight, it becomes good enough. Mm. And then the job losses start, and we don't know where they end, because you don't need to hire back if your company is more productive. If there's an economic shock, like a recession, and indications point to a recession in the next year or two, much easier to fire, but then you never rehire. Mm. Even something like in the US, the Federal Reserve, you know, adjusts interest rates, or the Bank of England here, and they have a mandate of inflation and unemployment. Mm -hmm. You reduce interest rates, people can spend more as consumers, and companies can hire more because they can borrow cheaper. What's going to happen is you reduce interest rates, companies just hire more AI workers, not human workers. Mm. So the link between labor and capital gets broken, and it doesn't reverse. It's not like the AI will get dumber. It's not that the AI will become less capable. The moment it becomes more capable than you as a remote worker, it doesn't go back. And then there's questions of, can you reskill enough jobs or create enough new jobs? Typically, we had time as we had the different revolutions, the internet, Industrial Revolution, because it took time to build the infrastructure. But this AI just uses existing infrastructure Yeah, to be better than humans. The link between labor and capital gets broken, and it doesn't reverse. For all of modern history, if a company got rich, it needed more people. If the economy boomed, wages eventually went up. But Emot is predicting a jobless recovery on steroids. If interest rates drop and capital becomes cheap, companies will invest that money in server farms and AI licenses, not payroll. This leads to a bifurcation of society, those who own the AI infrastructure and those who are competing against it. And as Imad notes, unlike the Industrial Revolution, which took decades to build factories, this revolution runs on the internet cables and laptops we already own. It spreads at the speed of light. The 1,000-day window is closing. We're transitioning from a world where humans are the engine of the economy to a world where we're at best the passengers and at worst the roadblocks. I want to know what you think. Is Imad Mastaki's prediction of negative value for human labor a paranoid delusion? Or are we already seeing the beginning of the end for the cognitive working class? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to stay ahead of this curve or at least understand what is coming, make sure to subscribe. This story is just getting started.